Would you stand as we lift up the praise and worship and name of our Savior this morning? returning we watch and we pray we will be ready the dawn of that day we'll join with singing with all the redeemed because satan is vanquished and jesus is king what a wonderful truth to proclaim this morning as we worship together would you continue worshiping and lifting up the name of our lord this morning Come adore on bend the knee, Christ the 
Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have the confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. In this season of Advent, we cling to the promise of Christ's second coming as we remember the waiting of God's people for the Messiah. We place our hope and trust in the one who has promised because he is faithful. Our hope in him brings peace and joy as we tune our whole beings to his presence. Henry Nouwen says, Jesus reveals to us God's love so that his joy may become ours and that our joy become complete. Joy is the experience of knowing that you are unconditionally loved and that nothing, sickness, failure, emotional distress, oppression, war, or even death can take that love away. There's something special about this holiday season. There's a little more generosity, a little more grace, a little more understanding. Even in the busyness of the season when many of our to-do lists are we can generally drum up a bit of goodwill and cheer. There is something about the wonder of Christmas and a baby being born in unlikely circumstances that emboldens our love and care for those around us. But the season ends all too quickly, and we are often thrust back into the noise of our regular and days and lives, and the light of Christmas fades as the winter moves on. But as people who walk with the light of Christ, in the light of Christ, with the miracle of his birth, life, and resurrection before us, and the hope, peace, and joy that we have in the knowledge that he is coming again. We are called to be people who love deeply, greatly, and without pause, even outside of this season. So as we get ready to move past our Christmas season, as we celebrate and enjoy our time together with our families, and as next week comes and the weeks after, would we turn our eyes to Jesus? May we be overwhelmed by his presence when we stare into his face. And would we let the things of this earth grow dim in the light of his glorious goodness, grace, and love? say 
together. You can be seated if you'd like, or you can come to the altar as always. Let's pray together. Jesus, you are such a wonderful Savior. We're so thankful for the way that you came could have come in a lot of different ways. Your creativity is endless. And yet you came as a baby. God, what was that like? The one who has always existed. Enjoyed perfect fellowship for all of eternity. Holds all power. All wisdom, all knowledge all goodness and you become one of your own creations <laughs> you became a baby a helpless little baby all the fullness of who you are would dwell in that little body what was that like Jesus What did you have to give up to do that? The perfection of heaven. To come to this place that has so much beauty because you created it and you are in the midst of it and yet it's broken and you came here for us. What did you have to give up to rescue us? That's the measure of our love, Lord. 
what we're willing to give up in order to put others first. Sometimes I even find myself being stingy, stingy towards those that I love, Lord, and what I'm willing to give up, let alone those that I don't know. And yet you came for a people that had turned their backs on you. When we were sinners, when we had chosen to go our own way, you still came for us. Your love is unlike any other. And we are so thankful for that love. Lord, may your love and what you were willing to sacrifice for all of us inspire us to live just like that, Lord. May our hearts be filled with your love. May our hearts expand. May our ability to love people and love people well expand. May our desire and, and joy in giving up others or giving up things for others uh, grow and grow. So our heart is like yours because we have never known a love like yours. And we want other people to know you. And sometimes it's, it's just a, it's knowing us and knowing your love through us first. So Lord, uh, would people be introduced to who you are and how you love and the way that we care for them? And we know we can't do that on our own. Not even close. And so Lord, thank you you came, that you died, and then you went to heaven. You sent your spirit to live in our hearts, to empower us to live that kind of life. We need you every hour, and we need you right now. We pray that you would speak to us, inspire us by your Holy Spirit, empower us, and transform us. Would you be with Pastor Tim as he brings your word? Your word is so powerful, Lord, and we need your word to transform the way that we think and the way that we live so that we can be your hands and feet in this place. We love you. Continue to speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We have our Christmas choir uh, presenting and sharing a song with us this morning.
Christmas time, one of the things that I remember most about our Lord becoming flesh um, is that he um, was one of us. And for me to follow somebody who was one of us, um, who um, came into our neighborhood, who chose to be like us, is somebody that I can give my worship to. And one of the things we do in worship is sing songs of praise. We pray, we join together, and we also release our holds, like he released his hold on the things that have been given to us. And in part, we do that through the giving of our tithes and offerings. And our boxes, our offering boxes, are located at the entrances as you come into the sanctuary and as you enter the building. You can also give online with the QR code in your bulletin. In the seat back in front of you is a communication card. If you're a visitor with us, would you take a moment and fill that out? Um, it is also a great way for you to get updates to us, prayer requests, things that are going on in your life. Um, after this service, we are having a fellowship time back in the Heritage Hall with donuts and coffee. I think donuts might be my love language. And so I just want to encourage you to come back and enjoy that on this Christmas uh, Eve. Um, and when we talk about fellowship, it is an opportunity. A lot of times in this church, we get together and we eat, and I like that. But um, fellowship isn't about eating. Fellowship is really about us being the body of Christ. It's about us sitting down together and enjoying one another, because that is why Christ died. It is for us to show our love to one another and to the world. And so we have a couple of fellowship opportunities coming up. Um, as you're going into your Christmas season, I want to put these on your mind so you can keep them in mind. One of them is every week, Wednesday nights, we join together for a family meal, um, and then we gather as men and women and teens and children um, and it is in those moments where I think I have formed the best relationships I have with the people in this church. So I would encourage you to do that. It starts next, not next Wednesday, um, January 3rd. Um, and the other thing coming up is men's and women's retreat. And so um, check your bulletin for details about that. It's a great opportunity to get to know one another in a better way. Um, because as we celebrate love this Advent, um, it is by our love that the world will know us. And so we need to be sure that we're loving one another, and that's an opportunity for us. Um, before the preaching of the word, we're going to stand and greet one another. Would you wish your brother or sister a Merry Christmas?
Good morning. You may be seated. By the way, uh, if, you, if my sermon gets a little too long this morning, all you have to do is say donuts, and I'll probably close it off quickly. So I wanted to show a video this morning. Um, back in November, I think in November 2nd, Max Wallacek had a car accident, and uh, boy, it was uh, very, it has been a very long journey. Not sure if he would survive. Not only that, not sure uh, what he would, how he would come through all this. Uh, God has been doing an amazing miracle in part through your prayers. And I just wanted, uh, if we have that video up there, just show a little bit of him doing what I don't know a month and a half ago any of us thought that this would be happening. And so we just praise the Lord for the way he is, the progress he is making. Continue to pray for him. Continue to pray for Alyssa and, and Max's family. Uh, the Eddingtons as well as we continue to see God work. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right, we're going to look at John chapter uh, 1, verse four, uh, 1 through 14. And by the way, tonight is our Christmas Eve service, one of my favorite services of all. I love Christmas Eve. We're having one service at 6 o'clock and looking forward to that time of great celebration. Um, John chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of a natural descent, nor of a human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Amen. We have seen the glory of Jesus Christ. Um, you know, some things go together and some things don't necessarily go together. Some things like, uh, I remember the old Reese's, Peace, uh, Reese's peanut butter commercials, uh, chocolate and peanut butter, two great things that go together. Then there are other things that don't go together like macaroni and craft macaroni and cheese ice cream, right? I like, I've eaten a lot of both of them, but not together, not mixed together like that. Uh, dark chocolate grilled cheese. Mm. Popcorn, which I love, popcorn flavored jelly beans. You ever tried one of those? I did. I thought they would be great because I love popcorn and I thought, yeah, that does not work well. On the other hand, there are some things that you would never think would go together that do go together. Like for me, it is pineapple and pizza. How many of you love pineapple and pizza, right? That's about 40%, maybe not even that much, man. I love that. I never thought I would and then had that Hawaiian pizza with the ham and, and it's, anyway, it's great. Um, Another thing that goes, because so, so, some things not just go together, they are better when they go together. You would not think they would go together well, but they are better together, like breakfast for dinner, right? Isn't that good? We've had that on Wednesday nights sometimes, breakfast for dinner. That's great. Um, laughing so hard you cry, right? Those two things don't seem to go together, and yet they do. How about being attracted to someone's imperfections? It does go together, right? I mean, I, you won't know this about my wife. I'm going to talk about her. It's easy to talk about her since she's never here. Um, but she does watch online. She's hearing this as, even as I speak. 
Um, but my wife has a bit of a temper. You guys wouldn't know that about her. I think I've told the story about when we were first married, how that uh, a shoe came flying off my, by my head when it was, she tripped over it for like the 10th time. Um, so she, it doesn't come out very often, but every now and then uh, it'll come out. And, and particularly it comes out if someone does something or says something about our family or about her or about our kids or me. Boy, it just, Katie, bar the door. And I mean literally Katie, the strongest member of our family, bar the door and keep Sandy from leaving the house because she is ready to go on a rampage. And um, not very often, but every now and then I have to talk her off the ledge. Okay, relax, you know, let's not, let's not go react that much. But I'm attracted to it, not because of her temper, I'm attracted to it because she has such a fierce, protective love spirit. And our children will, will, will tell you that. We always know, in fact, one of my kids told me this week, we always know that mom is in our corner all the time. And so sometimes that's the way it is. Sometimes these imperfections we see in other people actually uh, tell us a little bit about who they are. And we go, you know what, I don't love the imperfection, but you know what, I do. I'm attracted to that imperfection. Uh, another one that doesn't always go together, that does go together, you wouldn't think it would, but it does, is saying everything by saying nothing, right? Sometimes when you don't say, I told you so, <laughs> That says a lot. Sometimes just not saying anything when someone's messed up, is, it means the world, right? Job's friends, they, they, when Job was going through his grief, they just sat with him for seven days. They said so much by not saying anything. They said, we don't understand what you're going through. We cannot explain what you're going through. We, can, we are not going to try to minimize what you're going through. We're just going to sit with you. And then, unfortunately, after seven days, then they began to do everything they weren't supposed to do. And, and Job said, you guys are not much very good friends because you opened your mouth. And tried to explain or minimize what I was going through. Sometimes saying nothing says everything. Sometimes being strong, you are strongest when you reveal your weakness. But of all the ones that don't seem to fit together, that really do fit together, and when they come together, they're even more powerful. It is this story, John 1.14, grace and truth. Grace is wonderful. Truth is wonderful. You bring them together and something miraculous, something beautiful, something transformative happens. Grace and truth, they seem like opposites. If you can bring them together, you've got something powerful, the most powerful thing in the world. Grace and truth. Grace is unmerited favor. Grace is unconditional love and acceptance. Grace is something we, do, we receive love. We receive acceptance. We didn't earn it. We just receive it. In fact, I've earned judgment. I've earned criticism. The wages of sin is death. I've earned death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Grace is not getting what you deserve. Uh, grace is the wonderful, undeserved favor of God in favor of people. We don't deserve it, but they give it to us. They give us grace. And, and, and sometimes uh, it seems as if grace is overlooking the bad things we do, which immediately puts it in conflict with truth, right? Because truth does not overlook things. Truth judges what is real. Truth is the bright light that shines in the dark places. <laughs> Truth tells it like it is. And so we, we, we see that as these two, grace and truth, often in conflict with one another. And most of the time, people lean toward one or the other. And if I, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, we could do that. How many of you tend to be on the grace side? You're, you're, how many of you tend to be on the truth side? There are some people who are truth tellers who just are, they're always ready to tell the truth. There are people who are, who are grace givers. And they, they struggle with telling the truth. They, they struggle with it. And, and yet some people are truth tellers and compelled to tell the truth. Uh, they don't want to kid themselves. They want to be honest. They, they, and, and yet we, we desperately need both grace and truth. And John says, Jesus came full of grace and truth. This is why we need to follow him. <laughs> Among many reasons. 
This is why he can change your life. Because he is grace and truth combined. He is not 50% grace and 50% truth. He is 100% grace and 100% truth 100% of the time. He does not alternate between grace and truth, good cop, bad cop kind of thing. Sometimes we preachers do that. You listen to one of our sermons, it sounds like we're the bad cop. Listen to another sermon, we sound like we're the good cop. to, To be honest... Uh, it, it is hard to do that. It's hard to be able to balance that. Sometimes I often look at my sermons back by sermons and say, have I, have I leaned too much in one way or the other? But, but Jesus didn't have to worry about that. Jesus was full of grace and truth at the same time. That is who Jesus is. All grace, all truth, all the time. And that is what you and I both desperately need and our world needs those are two things great things that do go together because without grace you do not have the whole truth you're missing God's grace without grace you don't you don't have a whole picture and without truth you do not have grace Grace is not overlooking sin. Grace is overcoming sin. We need grace and truth. Henry Cloud tells a story of of Ruth. Ruth is a 22-year-old woman, who, uh, the daughter of a missionary, and she was suffering from depression. She had no appetite. She wasn't sleeping. She had trouble studying. Uh, Life was really going hard for her. So her father, her missionary father, brought her in to see Henry Cloud, the counselor, the psychologist, and um, when they came in, Dr. Cloud said, okay, so what, what's the problem? What's going on here? And the father said, it's pretty obvious what's going on. She's not living like she should. She's doing drugs. She's sleeping around. She's flunking out of school. She has no idea what she wants to be in her, with her life. And Dr. Cloud was getting ready to respond, but before he could say anything, he said, if she would just read her Bible, if she would just go to church, she wouldn't be so depressed, but all she wants to do is hang out with those reprobate friends of hers. And so when the father got done speaking, Dr. Cloud said, ask him, can I speak to Ruth alone? And the father left. And Dr. Cloud said this, Ruth, I think if I had to live with your father, I'd take drugs too. Does his attitude towards you have anything to do with your discouragement? And he said, tears welled up in her eyes. He said, I don't know all your story, but I can tell that you're very depressed. And I don't think it's because you aren't doing the things your father says you should. I think there are reasons, very good reasons, logical reasons, that your father has not taken the time to understand. And Dr. Cloud said after more counseling, it was obvious that she had lived so many years of truth without grace. That everywhere she turned, she ran into someone telling her who she should be and what she should do, and she never felt any acceptance. And Henry Cloud talks about what the book of Romans calls the law of sin and death. Romans says this law of sin and death holds us captive. This law of sin and death keeps us from being free to love God and love others. This law of sin and death brings death. It is a spiritual law that brings death, that brings condemnation. The law of sin and death doesn't give us any hope. It brings guilt. It brings shame. And just like with Adam and Eve, when we feel shame in that way, we try to hide from God and hide from others. We spend our life hiding, pretending, trying to silence the guilt and sin. The law of sin and death silences us. It brings anger. It arouses sinful passions, Paul talks about. It increases sin. It puts us under a curse. It holds us prisoners. It condemns us and alienates us from Christ. The law of And the solution, the rescue to the law and sin and death is the grace of God, the free gift of God that came through Jesus Christ who entered our world, who came into solidarity with us, who stood by us in our sin and shame and took our place and therefore defeated sin and guilt and shame in our life so we could be free and experience his forgiveness. 
Jesus is full of grace and truth. And grace comes first, right? John said grace and truth. Grace comes first because like uh, the Colonel Jessup in, in that movie says, we can't handle the truth without grace. I love that song, Holy Water, where it says, I don't want to abuse your grace, but God, I need it every day. It is the only thing that really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace, but God, I need it every day because it's the only thing that really wants to make me change. It's the only thing that gives us hope that we can change. And in the New Testament, what happens, if you read the New Testament closely, you'll find what happens is the first thing that happens when Christ enters our life is He gives us a new identity. He tells us we are different. We are adopted. We are children of God. He treats us differently. We are graced and we are part of a, a, a new way of living. And then the, then the transformation begins to happen. As, as basically uh, the New Testament says, now live out who you are. You are loved of God. You are loved children of God. That's who you are. You are saints. You are holy people. Uh, now live out of that identity. So we need grace. Because uh, truth without grace is not truth. We're missing something. But we also need truth, and, and in our world today, there is a danger to forget the second part. Jesus was not just grace, Jesus was truth. John makes that abundantly clear as he writes that, this letter, as he writes this chapter. He is the true light that shines into the world. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it, John says. The light, Jesus is the light. Someone has said that the light of day is the best antiseptic. <laughs> but John says, men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. We love darkness because we want to hide up the evil deeds that we have. We love darkness because no one will see what it is. Um, so we, we don't love the light. We, sometimes we love flashlights or spotlight you, we, we like spotlights especially if we're behind the behind the spotlight controlling where it goes and, and we like to focus on different issues and different subjects and different problems and different people we can we can focus that spotlight on that that, that we, we like the spotlight it gives us a little circle of truth and we can really be emphasized we want to be we're truth tellers we want that spotlight on that issue and so Republicans like to shine the spotlight on Democrats, and Democrats like to spot, shot the spotlight on Republicans, and nothing ever changes in politics. You know why? Because they don't want daylight. They want the spotlight that they can just control, and then they can keep their deeds in the darkness. And sometimes that's the way we are. We like looking at other people, we can be very strong truth tellers when we're behind the light, at least pointing it to someone. But can we, can we turn it? What happens when it comes back on us? Now, again, part of the problem is sometimes we are so overwhelmed with condemnation that we can't handle the truth. That's why Jesus came with grace and truth so that the spotlight the light could come to us, the daylight, not the spotlight. That, that's way too harsh. That sounds way too harsh. That's not the intent. It is daylight. Christ is the light who comes into the darkness and shines the light. And when, when daylight is here, you don't walk around. In the, in, in, at noonday, you're not walking around with a spotlight or a flashlight, are you? You don't need it. What's the point? And that's Christ. He is the light. Uh, Proverbs talks about this. Proverbs chapter 4. And a beautiful passage here. The path of the righteous is like the morning sun, shining ever brighter till the light of day. Boy, that, that phrase there is enough to make, that's enough to live your life after, right? The path of the righteousness is like Christ has come. He is the morning sun. He's the day star. Morning, morning sun, he's come, and, and he, is, he has shown that light. 
And now it just keeps getting brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter so that today I'm living in more light than I did yesterday. Right, as Paul talks about, we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed from one degree of glory into the next degree of glory, day by day transformation. The path of the righteous is like the morning sun and it just gets brighter and brighter in the light of day. We just continue to allow the darkness to be pushed back by the light. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what make them stumble. keep tripping over things and, and, and they don't know what makes them stumble they look at what makes them stumble they blame other things for it they blame other people for it they blame society or problems or parent or whoever but they keep stumbling again and again and again and they never ask themselves you know what what is the common denominator of my stumbling it's not other people it's me never allow that light to come back and say maybe the reason I'm stumbling maybe the reason that I have problems is not because of everyone else maybe this problem that keeps plaguing me is actually something in me but the wicked the way of the wicked is like deep darkness they do not know what makes them stumble and then he goes on later just a couple of verses later above all else guard your heart can you see why he brings that into it Talk about darkness. Talk about light. Guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. We know that the heart is deceitful above all else. We know that, that sometimes we think our motives are right, and we have to allow the light to investigate that, and we find out maybe it's not right. So above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free from perversity. Keep corrupt talk from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you, as Hebrews says on Christ, the, the author of our faith. Give careful thought to the paths of your feet and steadfast in all your ways. Give careful thought every step. Why am I taking this step? I'm about ready to do this. I'm about ready to make this action, do this thing, say this word. Why am I doing that? What is in my heart that makes me do that? And is it a, am I on solid footing? Or am I drifting out into the darkness? Where does this change of course going to take me? If I start heading off into the darkness, where does it end? It's just one step. It's, it's not a, well, it's just one step, but that's, every journey begins with one step. Give careful thought to your paths of your feet and stead, be steadfast in all your ways do not turn to the right or the left keep your foot from evil our capacity to deceive our capacity to manipulate to scheme is amazing our capacity to minimize our own sins to mislead to deny to rationalize to justify to exaggerate our strengths is, is in, endless. Proverbs says that if you want wisdom, you need to seek it with all your heart. You need to seek it like you're seeking after golden diamonds. You need to seek after wisdom like it's the most important thing in your life, because it is. The writer of Proverbs, I would say the same way with truth. It, the writer of Proverbs says if you don't seek wisdom with all your heart, you're not going to get it. You will not find it. Unless you decide that is what will you want more than anything else. Then you'll find it. But if you don't, you won't find it. Same way with truth. If I really don't want to see the truth, I will not see it. I won't. Because I am so good at justification and rationalization and defending myself and pretending the only way I will see the truth is if I say in the psalmist, search me, O God, see if there be some wicked way in me. Whereas the Apostle Paul says, my heart is clear, my conscience is clear. Um, I, I, I don't see anything in my life that's wrong, but it is not. I'm not the one who judges me. The Lord judges me. It's not me. My heart is clear. My conscience is clear. But I don't even take that into account. I don't even count that as putting a credit in my box. 
I'm going to let the Lord judge me because I know how easy it is for me to be deceived. If we want to know the truth, we, we, have, to, we have to want it. If not, we won't, we won't see it. And we always look at other people and we say, why can't they see what everyone else can see? I wonder what they're saying about me. <laughs> you guys can tell me on your way out. No. No, it's Christmas Eve. We'll do that for another day. That sounds like a Lenten thing, right? Not a Christmas Eve thing. Are we willing to sacrifice for the truth? And that's what it is. It's really, it is sacrifice. A uh, man who was imprisoned in the Soviet gulag, Natan Sharansky, I was reading an interview with him this week, and he said, he, he, when he was young, he went to school on the day that Joseph Stalin died. And the family at home celebrated Joseph Stalin's death. He killed so many of the own Russian people, so they were celebrating him. But when he went to school, he was forced to mourn for Joseph Stalin's death. And he talks about that, how that so much of the Soviet Union government was built on lies, and they pushed you, pressured you to keep lying in these little ways. You know, just act like you're, act like you're mourning over this guy when you're not. And they just kept pressuring that. Make life comfortable, more comfortable for you if you just lie. Little lies lead to bigger lies, little compromise to bigger compromises until you have a whole society that is morally bankrupt. And the same can happen to us. The truth can be uncomfortable. We don't want to experience that uncomfortableness. So we cover it up. And it just can build. We need the truth in our life. Jesus Christ is the truth. Jesus Christ is the light. Lord, shine your light on it. It's not, uh, it's not a, a, a bunch of rules that is the light. It is not a, a bunch of words that is the light. It is Jesus Christ the light. He is the light. We follow him. We walk with him. We, we let him nudge us. We get very sensitive to his leadership in our life so that we're really ready to see the light in our life. We want the light, Lord, tell me. See if there be some wicked way in me. Grace without truth is not truth, but truth without grace is not truth. Jesus perfectly combined the two. I like uh, the passage, 1 Corinthians 13. We talked about this a few weeks ago. But I thought about this when I was talking about truth. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. In other words, when the Apostle Paul begins to describe that future day when we will see Christ, he describes it in that way of being known and knowing then I shall know fully even as I am fully known. We were created with a desire to know people, to know God, to know people, and to be known by people. We were created to connect with people, to have intimacy where we are known and, and we know someone. And one of the most powerful things in the world is happens when you really begin to know someone, when they reveal something of themselves and, and you are known by them and you know them. Paul when, when, that, when we, that day comes, we will know fully and be fully known, known by God and known by others. And that is, that is what we're all working for. And that is what the church is called to be, a place where we are known and we know others, where we experience Christ, grace and truth, and we can experience that level of intimacy where we actually don't hide who we are, we can reveal who we are and experience God's grace and truth. James says, confess your sins one to another that you may be healed. The book of Galatians says it this way. Paul writes in Galatians, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, here's truth, right? If someone is caught in a sin, don't just ignore it. Don't just walk away from it. Don't just pretend that you didn't see it. No, if someone is caught in a sin. You who live by the Spirit, which is really key, right? <laughs> 
You don't want anyone else who's not following the Spirit. But you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you may be tempted. In other words, with humility. I'm helping you out because you're in a sin, but buddy, I know I could be there just like you, so I have no reason to boast. I'm not proud. I'm not coming in higher than you. We're all on the same level, and I know how Satan can trap. I know how he can tempt. I know how he can get us caught into things. Therefore, I come humbly through the Spirit, ready to restore you gently. And then he says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you fulfill the, the law of Christ. That is that is what the church is called to do, right? We are called to be people who can flesh out the grace and truth that Jesus brings in community. In community, and that's what it takes. Read the New Testament, read the Old Testament, you'll find there is no idea that God is going to uh, save us without being a part of a people. It's just the way it is. We are redeemed through fellowship with one another. We reveal, Christ reveals himself to us through one another, and it is in relationship with one another, intimate relationships with one another, where we know each other and we are fully known, where grace and truth does its work. Having someone in your life that can bring grace and truth to your life is just invaluable. And I just pray that this new year, you will look deeply to find a relationship like that that someone can be that grace and truth for you. Because it is, we need that. We need someone who can look into our life, and I've got that in people in my life, pastor friends who are allowed, who, who have the right to be able to say to me, Tim, there's something I see that I'm concerned about. Grace and truth. But there are people who love me. All the grace in the world doesn't diminish the truth, not one ounce. All the truth in the world does not diminish grace, not one ounce. Grace and truth comes together. Grace doesn't fall away in the presence of truth. In fact, it is quite the opposite. Grace does its best work when truth is the hardest. And I want to end with one of my favorite stories. It's from the novel Raisin in the Sun. Um, Walter Lee has been cheated out of a large sum of money, the family's money, and now he has to go back and accept the buyout offer from the white uh, home association, community association that didn't want blacks living there anyway. And so he had to humiliate himself by selling out to them, which he didn't want to do. His sister, Benita, is furious at her brother. He's no brother of mine. That individual in that room from this day on is no brother of mine. The mother admonishes her daughter, you're feeling that you're better than he is today, yes? What did you tell him a minute ago, that he wasn't a man, yes? You give him up for me. You wrote his epitaph too, didn't you? Like the rest of the world. Well, who gave you that privilege? Benita responded, Mama, will you be on my side for once? Now you saw what he did. You saw him down there on his knees. Wasn't it you who taught me to despise any man who would do that? Who would do that? what he's going to do. Yes, I taught you that, me and your daddy, but I thought I taught you something else too. I thought I taught you to love him. Love him, there's nothing left to love. And then she says, there's always something left to love. Have you cried for that boy today? No, I don't mean for yourself and for the family because we lost the money. I mean for him and what he's gone through. God help him, what is done to him. Child, when do you think it's time to love somebody the most? When he's done good and made things easy for some, everybody? Oh no. It's when he's at his lowest and can't believe in himself because the world done whipped him so. When you start measuring somebody, measure them right, child. You make sure you can't take into account the hills and valley he's come to to get wherever he is. Truth is not truth without the greatest truth that we are loved by God. If you want the whole truth and nothing but the truth, you need the most important truth. 
For in Christ, the truth did not come through a book or through rules or through punishment or, or through a court ruling. The truth came in a person, a baby born in Bethlehem to show us that he was with us and he came to rescue us. Let's bow our heads forward to prayer. Maybe there's someone out here today who has never put their faith in Jesus Christ. <laughs> Lord, grace and truth, boy, I need that in my life. I need that in my life. I, I, it's the way redemption works. It's the way transformation works, that grace and truth. We need it both. Thank you, Lord, for the time when you came into our life and you graced us, Lord. We, we, we came before you, Lord, as sinners. We came before you full of condemnation and guilt. And yet you loved us while we were yet sinners. You died for us on the cross and freed us from our sin. Right now, Lord, maybe one will pray with me, Lord, I have, I'm a sinner. I've, I'm lost. I have failed so greatly. But I ask for your forgiveness. And you wipe us clean. As far as the east is from the west, you remove our sins from us, never to remember it against us again. And we are adopted as children. Those who receive him and believe on his name become children of God, not born by humans, but born of God. The Spirit works in us, Lord. So right now, Father, for the one who receives you today, may your Spirit, we know your Spirit moves upon them. That, that Spirit of grace and truth, the Spirit of Jesus comes into their life. The truth is that we are sinners, but the truth is that we are loved and we are graced and we are favored and the light shines and it shines so that we would be transformed. Now, Father, would you work in us, Lord, that we would be the people who could proclaim this tremendous message to the world that needs it. May we be transformed by the light, by the grace and truth that we might be a community that demonstrates who you are. Thank you, Father. And now may the love of our Father and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all God's people said, amen. Amen.